when we understand the ways of God, we recognize his presence, we recognize what he's doing, it it creates more faith. When we don't understand the ways of God, Mm -hmm. he can be manifesting, doing things, but we don't know. That's one of the ways God moves, and we miss it. It's not that God's not speaking or moving. We just don't know how to recognize it. So... Well, I had the great privilege of interviewing a man that is a, an amazing scholar of the New Testament, uh, probably written uh, many more commentaries than most people do, uh, a prolific writer, a man of God, a man I respect. A uh, man I got to meet several years ago, and we had a, a theological discussion in a hotel. And I still remember it. And uh, I thank you that he sent me most of his books. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but I think it's a privilege to have you. And so what I wanted to do is just not so much have a, a formal uh, dis, uh, teaching as a discussion. I have some questions, and uh, and I'm not sure exactly where this is going to go. Uh, because it, the Spirit may lead us to go into another area and may not have time to, to do everything. Um, but there are some things that's, that I have a great emphasis on and concern about, and I want to get Craig, Dr. Craig Keener, uh, his opinion on. And, um, and I know there's times we may not agree, and that's fine. We can agree to disagree. Um, so, uh, Craig, we want to pray and then we'll start. Well, Lord, we ask that you would be with us and you would superintend in, over our discussion. And, and Father, I pray that there'd be positive, practical, uh, powerful insights that would come out of it in the name of Jesus. And we pray that for those that's watching, it would be of interest to them. And I hope that for some, it might even be an aha moment. I never saw that before. And so we pray that we would um, would be light and our discussion would create light in darkness or enough heat to remove some of the fog. And so we, we pray in Jesus' name for you to be glorified through what we discuss. Amen. So, uh, Craig, I was in the vineyard for like 16 years. And the, the last 21 years, uh, I've not been in a vineyard, but I've been part of a movement that I'm actually one of the leaders in. Uh, there are six of us called the Revival Alliance, six apostolic leaders that work together a lot. Uh, it's an informal organization. It's really not even organ. It's, it's just a relational basis, more as a, a covenant of love uh, and helping each other. Uh, in that group that I am in, um, we do believe in apostolic and prophetic and all the continuation of the Ephesians for Doma gifts. Mm-hmm. And um, I know there's debate as to whether or not those gifts are offices or functions or better be understood as ministries. Um, and and there's a lot around that whole discussion that I have a lot of interest in, but I, I just, I, and we may get there, probably won't. Uh, but I do think that people should know as we start that I, uh, I'm a strong believer in the continuation of the gifts. Actually, uh, I started a seminary and we're just now starting this August a doctoral, two doctoral programs. And I think we have six master's programs. Um, that's committed. And to be known is we're not saying here's all the views. We may say here's all the views, but we're going to say, but and this is the one we believe. We're committed to the continuationist perspective about the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the church today. So when I was doing my demand at a Methodist institution in Dayton, Ohio, um, United Theological Seminary, um, I was writing about the effects of Christian prayer upon chronic pain and loss of range of motion from 
surgical, surgical implanted materials. And that's what I was writing. I was studying about healing. And as I'm writing the biblical and theological and historical foundations for my paper, my dissertation or thesis, uh, I became aware of, um, I knew that there was a lot of, of more liberal professors that didn't believe in the supernatural, didn't believe, you know, in nature miracles, didn't believe in multiplication of bread, didn't, you know, just didn't believe in resurrection, didn't believe. I mean, I knew that. Um, and I knew that there were very fundamentalist conservative Christians that believed it in the Bible, but they didn't believe, don't believe it continues today. I, I understood that. But I was just blown away by an article in um, Kittle's uh, New Testament the dictionary, theological dictionary of the New Testament on um, dealing with signs, signs and wonders. And it seemed like, and I, I right now the, the author's name escapes me, but it just seemed like what he was saying was the opposite of what John's intention was for the signs and wonders. These things are written and so that you may believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, Everything that Jesus did was written. He used hyperbole. All the books of the world couldn't contain it. And, and, uh, if, and so the, the author is basically saying that, uh, John was written to refute the synoptics who he felt was, particularly Matthew was trying to make Jesus into a new Moses and a, with, uh, with signs and wonders and was, uh, actually, um, uh, trying to soften that. And um, really didn't want to commit, and, and it'd be based upon John four forty eight. If, uh, unless you people see signs, one is you're never going to believe. But the, the negative connotation. So you can read that same passage with a rough sound of your voice, and it makes like he's Jesus is upset because they are asking for a sign, and or you can read it with a connotation and tone of voice uh, that, yeah, I understand, unless you people see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. Because he just turns right around and, and performs a sign. Not because they've asked, but because of the man's uh, uh, faith. Um, so I came away from that with, with this. Uh, this is a long introduction, but I want to get this thing set because this is what really hooked me to begin with, was this this view about John and John's view of faith and faith that was connected to any in faith in some way connected to the supernatural, the seeing signs and wonders is a lesser kind of faith. Uh, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that like that is a superior kind and, and faith that's uh, connected to signs and wonders is um, an inferior or less uh, quality uh, kind of faith. So it makes faith that's connected to the miraculous seem to be suspect. Th that was the argument of this particular scholar. And, and when I looked at it, it just seems like that's, that's the opposite because if that's what he real John was really intending, then in almost every miracle, every sign of the signs he had, the seven signs, um, He'll say, he thus revealed his glory. Yeah. That's, and that's the way God re, uh, revealed his glory in Jesus through what he did. And the testimony of what he did was revealing his glory. And this is a, like in Acts 2.11 where, I mean, John 2.11 where uh, yeah. Jesus performed the uh, turning the water into wine. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Mm -hmm. And if you trace that all the way through, almost Every time there is one of these major signs that, he, that John chose out of the many things Jesus did, he connects it and the people believed in him. He said, oh, surely this is the prophet with a cap P, you know, one of the messianic uh, expectations of the people between Malachi and Matthew was there could be two roles of the Messiah, king, but also prophet. Uh, and so you had the, and I'm not saying that was so much in the Old Testament, but it was at least in a, in a, uh, inter biblical, some of the inner biblical times. So the only time that it seems like that, 
um, he doesn't commend someone's uh, faith is he he becomes upset with them because they didn't believe in spite of having seen the miracles. And the other thing that and tied in with this is where Jesus said it'd be it'd be more tolerable tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum and some of the cities that he had done his greatest miracles in. It was almost as if there was a a higher accountability when there had been a greater revelation of his power and his glory through what he had done, holding uh, to, uh, uh, in some way even more accountable um, for um, not believing. So my question is, today, there are a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, seeing the church grow, uh, wanting to see the church grow. The, uh, there's a real problem in our culture today. The Generation Z is the least evangelized in many, many generations. Uh, this very young generation. Uh, the, the millennials are not as committed as baby boomers who are not as committed to the one generation before them. So we're in this slide and the numbers of people getting saved is and for particularly the mainline denominations are losing members at an alarming rate. And it's my opinion that there is scriptural reason uh, to say that there's a pattern in the scripture that in addition to the words we use, uh, the gospel, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, in addition to that basic kerygma, uh, there's also the important role of the signs and wonders, healings and miracles to confirm the word. Um, when I go to other cultures that are not Christian, you know, I, I have gone to several countries that are, they don't have Christian cultures. They have other religious cultures, Hindu, Buddhist, um, particularly the main, the main two. I haven't been like some of my friends to too many countries that where Islam was the main religion, but even if it, if it was, if that was the case, it seems like our ap apologetic is so based upon um, reason. Uh, as Ruthman talks about in his book on Scottish common sense, that, that whole thing that, that I think uh, evidence that demands a verdict and more evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. It, it, uh, it's good for what it does, mm -hmm. but by itself, it's not enough because a lot of it is based upon that really works well if you're in a, a culture that has a... Uh, Heritage, Christian heritage in that culture. For example, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, Billy Graham could stand and say, the Bible says, and it automatically had authority in the lives, even the many of the of unbelievers' lives in America, because even if they weren't a Christian, they believed the Bible was from God, a holy book. But if you're not, Christian, that's not the case. They say, well, we have the Quran or we have the, uh, our holy books. And so it's, it seems to be, and I'll, I won't let you come because I know you're getting ready. I know you're ready, but I just want to look, tie this up. It seems that that is not the way the early evangelists won the pagans of Europe. It seems like, and you've mentioned this, and I, I know we, we're familiar with the same writings of uh, McRamsey, uh, yeah. um, Christianizing the Roman Empire, uh, the first 300 years. Um, it, it doesn't seem like that's the way they did it. It seems like what they did was as they preached the gospel, which is different from preaching doctrine or preaching or teaching uh, other things 
from the scripture, that the gospel itself, as they were preached in the gospel, it was backed up mm-hmm. by miracles mm-hmm. and healing and particularly deliverance. And because of the power of healings and deliverance, mm-hmm. it was like, and, and I actually have done this, preached my, this myself in India. I said, if God doesn't come and heal you, then, then what I'm saying is not the truth. Because I knew he was going to come and heal them. I had no doubt. And we saw like uh, 100,000 people, 50,000 of them were, t- were waving their hands. They received some type of healing. And then in the invitation, 30-some thousand uh, I responded to the invitation. So my, 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 sum it up this way. Instead of starting with the Bible says, and, and because of that, you, uh, if you're not dealing with Christian culture, it's better to preach the gospel with signs and wonders following. That brings them by the Holy Spirit. They see the truth to Christ. And once they come to Christ, then they can accept this is the word of God. Starting there in a non-Christian culture isn't as power, loses a lot of its power because they need to know they don't, well, they actually, they don't believe that's the word of God until they see the power of God. When I was an atheist, <clears throat> some people brought me the gospel. I'm pretty sure they were cessationist, so they didn't believe in the signs and wonders. And they also were very bad at apologetics. <laughs> uh, but they brought me the gospel. The, 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 well, the part of the gospel they brought me was enough for, for me to be confronted by God and I was converted through an encounter with the Holy Spirit afterwards. But if I had seen a sign of wonder, or if they had given me some good apologetics, either of those would have gotten my attention. But the Lord worked with what He had. <laughs> they gave me the. They told me Jesus died and rose again, and God, God worked me over. Um, but yeah, through history, I mean, that's when when I was a young Christian. I noticed that pattern in the book of Acts, that that was the main method for getting people's attention for the gospel. So, I mean, you couldn't just do the signs and wonders and not talk about Jesus, obviously. But on the day of Pentecost, the tongues got people's attention, and then Peter preached about, this is that which Joel spoke about, and he preaches from Scripture. Of course, to to the Jewish people, they preached from Scripture, and Paul quotes poets in Athens, and and so forth. But uh, also in, in chapter um, 3, when the man gets healed in the temple, and then uh, it becomes an occasion for preaching, and then they're told to shut up, not preach anymore in this man's name, and they go back and they pray, God, continue to stretch forth your hand with signs and wonders to continue to grant us to speak the word of God with boldness. And Verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. And in the following verses, it also mentions, like it, back it did in 2.43, uh, but it also mentions the continuing power, so signs and wonders. And yeah, I mean, it's a pattern that, that continues throughout the book of Acts. I did see that there were some other forms, some other ways that were available to people. Apollos, we don't read of any signs and wonders with him, just like not with John the Baptist, but he was a really good debater. And so there were certain forums where you could get a hearing. He went into those forums, and he was very useful with that. But it's not like it's one or the other. Paul was good at both. And so um, he set set things up in the school of Tyrannus in Acts 19.9 and was teaching there. But at the same time, verses 11 and 12, People would take, uh, probably these were like his sweat aprons. Mm-hmm. They weren't like, he, uh, it wasn't like, okay, here's my, here's my handkerchief. Let me blow my nose on it and wipe it on people. But, uh, you know, um, sometimes it's translated handkerchiefs, but they would take his, his sweat cloths, his work aprons, whatever, and they would go lay them on people. And it was just like what you had back in 515. Peter's shadow came on people. It was enough. Uh, I'm not sure it was at that level all the time, 
But in Ephesus, this was like the peak of mm-hmm. when this was happening with Paul, Acts, Acts 19, 11, and 12. Um, and we see in verse 10 and verse 17 and verse 20, that during that time, the word of the Lord spread through that whole province of, of Roman Asia. So it is a pattern. It continues in Acts chapter 28. Um, and it's also in Paul's letters. Um, Paul mentions it, as we were talking about before, Paul mentions it in places where <laughs> Luke doesn't mention it. People say, oh, Luke must have exaggerated this. Well, Paul, you know, places where Luke doesn't mention it, uh, we know it was happening there because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, you Corinthians, you were witnesses of the signs and wonders of an apostle done among you. In the Romans 15, 19, Paul says, Everywhere I went, you know, he's not talking about it all the way through his letters because he's he's writing to Christians. But when he talks in those letters about the founding of the churches, then he does, you know, either probably imply it, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, we talked about 1 Thessalonians 1, but also uh, in, um, in, in Romans 15, 19, wherever he went, it was being confirmed with signs and wonders. And it was the word, the gospel, um, like in, in Acts 14, I think it's verse 3, it says that God was doing these signs and wonders, confirming the word of his grace that Paul and Barnabas were preaching. So, I mean, which, which, we're still preaching that word, right? That message of his grace. Right. And, and the other thing is that the signs and wonders weren't attesting to or confirming the the apostles Mm -hmm. it was confirming the word yes the the gospel itself and so you know the 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 idea that okay um the miracles were relegated to the apostles which that doesn't work out because uh you got Stephen having miracles. You got Philip having miracles, and they're in and uh, the uh, some people say maybe the first deacons, and then they became evangelists. And I say, well, they were deacons. They were anointed. They got more hands laid on by the apostles. They got more than what they thought. Yeah, and 16. they ended up at least the two of them being yeah. you know, a very powerful evangelists. And it does seem like in the New Testament, the evangelist. Uh, were second only to the apostles in the numbers of signs and wonders that's uh, mentioned in their lives. Um, it, it seems, at least from the uh, from the book of Acts, anyway, um, and even the other letters. So you, you've got that, and, and evangelists were being used. And it's really interesting. He, he talks about apostles. And then he, in in uh, First Corinthians twelve twenty eight, and then he he talks about apostles, prophets, um, and and what what those who work miracles and those with gifts of healing. It's really interesting because in Ephesians four, it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, pastors, and teachers, and and so in First Corinthians twelve twenty eight, in that place where the evangelists would have been, he doesn't use that word. But he talks about this function, those who had gifts of healing and working of uh, miracles. Now, I don't think don't it's... Leave out, don't leave out teachers. That's the third one in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, oh, and, and by the way, I actually, you know, I was a pastor for 30 years mm-hmm. before I was uh, traveling. Well, I was a, uh, yeah, I was a pastor for... 22 years before I started traveling and I continued for more, eight more. So I, I was a pastor for 30 years mm. and I've been in ministry now 51 years. Uh, in the last 21, I haven't been pastoring. I've been um, working with pastors, but I have a heart for pastors. And as I've seen myself as an evangelist at times, I, I see myself as having at least an apostolic function as knowing I've been sent uh knowing it was by a prophetic word and called out by John Wimber and what God's going to do with you and all that. Um, and confirmed by several other uh, prophetic words from people who didn't know anybody else had said. And it's almost exact same words. Now, I don't have a 
card that says evangelist Randy Clark or apostle Randy Clark or, you know, pastor Randy Clark. But I do feel that if the role of the teacher, pastor teacher, uh, in that role, and I do think that usually the, the lead pastor is always the best, usually the teaching pastor most of the time. And whether that's two different gifts or one, I, I don't really know. Um, but I do believe if they teach concepts and cause the people to come to an understanding of the ways of God so that the lay people come into an understanding of the ways of God and, and the, re, the, the causal relationship between certain gifts of spirit to other gifts that then connect, it's like a chain connection. This causes this, causes this. Then not so much from an, an emotional appeal, but from a rational appeal. Oh, I understand. I am understanding better the ways of God. I am understanding how these things can, can function. That when a pastor does that, uh, he or she will see more happen in the supernatural in their church. Conversely, if an, if an apostle comes in or an evangelist comes in and they have a healing meeting and, 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 uh, um, lots of great things happen. But when they leave, if the pastor teacher doesn't build on that, um, it doesn't grow. And that church doesn't come into uh, the um, the greatness of what God has for it. I, I say that because I've seen it. I've I've worked for twenty years now in some of the many different denominations, some of the largest churches in the world, the largest Baptist church in Brazil, South Africa, uh, Argentina, uh, so I've, and uh, large Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, you know, large Nazarene church in Brazil. So I've been in a lot of different denominations. And what I've seen, even if it's a wonderful church, we have wonderful things. And every time we go, the miracles that take place. I mean, miracles. One church we had, we had, I think in eight days, 20 death and, and, uh, 12 blind and, uh, paraplegic it had been shot and his bullet went through and severed is his it, spine. Is that the police officer? Police officer. Yeah. Yeah, the 25 year old police officer. So, but, if that wasn't taught on after I left, mm -hmm. when I came back, we start over. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that, that there's more expectation on the part of the people, but the mm -hmm. expectations kind of wrongly placed. I found out later, they called my team. They, they said, we, they called them the miracle workers, my team. Mm -hmm. And they thought I lied to them because the, the executive pastor told me this. Uh, our people really love you, but they think that you lie to them about one thing. And I said, what's that? It really bothered me. What, what did they think I lied? They said, when you tell them that the people that you brought with you are just like them. And I usually have said, how many of you are in the ministry? Pastors are, you know, and it's usually no more than 10%. Mm -hmm. So 90% of my, ten are, my team are lay people. And so much happens to them that they don't believe. They said, they believe that you have found healers from all over the world and you've hired them to come with you mm. <laughs> but because they they just didn't believe that god could use uh them mm -hmm. like that so my thing is and i i'm glad you corrected me on it because i do believe that apostles and evangelists see, see the most healings in 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 the book of acts but i also believe that if this if that's not built on by good teaching mm -hmm. you will not see the breakthrough because the people don't have understanding. I love that passage. One of my favorite passages, Exodus 33, where Moses says, if I found favor in your sight, then teach me your ways that I may know you. And, and there is a truth. They say, well, if I, how, what's it mean that I may know you? It's, it's, it's not, he already knew God, but he knows him better. Mm. And when we understand the ways of God, we recognize his presence. We recognize what he's doing. It, it creates more faith. When we don't understand the ways of God, mm -hmm. he can be manifesting, doing things, but we don't know. That's one of the ways God moves and we miss it. It's not that God's not speaking or moving. We just don't know how to recognize it. So, and I love it in the bottom of that same chapter of 33 of Exodus, he said, now show me your glory. Yeah. And I just think when we understand better the ways of God, which is mainly a teaching role, 
It's, 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 this is where strong, strong teaching here is so important. Um, then, then we see his power, which reveals his glory. I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to get us off on a, a sidetrack that long, but I want to kind of come back to, um, to what you were, you were saying about in the book of Acts, it's not just the apostles, because like you said, Philip the evangelist, yeah. and he's called an evangelist, I think, in chapter 21, but in chapter 8, he's doing this work, and he's, um, he's got signs and wonders, and then the power encounter, Simon can't, can't even match that stuff. Yeah. Um, Stephen is doing it back in 6 8, although the mm-hmm. main thing uh, Luke emphasizes in his, his case is, the theological groundwork that he really lays for, you know, God not being localized just in Jerusalem. But you've also got like Ananias, who's mm-hmm. just, you know, he's not said to be anybody. Any, Chapter nine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and God, uh, sends him in a vision to Saul, uh, in, in chapter nine, verse 17. He says, so that you, you may be healed, your eyes may be healed, and you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so it wasn't limited just to apostles. Yeah. When I was doing my PhD at Duke, there was a group on campus that was affiliated with a certain sect. I wouldn't really call them a cult. I really think they knew they knew Jesus, but they thought they were the only ones who knew Jesus. <laughs> and and so um they were uh that, uh, th- that movement has has mellowed out some since then, but at the time they were saying you have to be baptized to be saved. You have to be baptized in their church to be saved. And so there was this one young lady with their formula. With their formula. Well, okay. well no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the, okay, okay. It wasn't the, yeah, the people you're thinking of. It's, yeah. it's something different. Okay. Uh, but um, so there was this one young lady and and. Some of us who were believers have been reaching out to her, but she uh, she was getting involved with them. And so I, I spoke to her and I said, you know, here are the things where I think that they're not right on. And she said, okay, well, for me to decide, I need to hear both sides at once. So I'm, you know, the person who was her discipler uh, was, I think, girlfriends or I think the girlfriend of one of the associate pastors. And so he was going to come and I was going to come and we're each going to present our case. And so they were saying baptism is necessary for salvation. And I said, well, yeah, if you're saved, you, you need to get baptized. It's the way you demonstrate your, your commitment to Christ. But, uh, but for you saying that that's when, anyway, I, I went into the cultural background of what baptism meant in that culture. I was going into detail on it. He said, no, no, you can't use cultural background. You can only use the biblical text. So I said, okay, let's take something else that you guys believe. You guys believe that the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today because you believe that uh, it only came through the laying on of the hands of the apostles and the apostles were only in the first century. So let's look actually at what the Bible says about whether the apostles were only these particular people the 12 that you think that they were. I mean, in, in Luke's writing, Luke usually uses the term just for the 12. He makes an exception in Acts 14 for Paul and Barnabas. But Paul uses the term in a much wider way. And even in Revelation, it's used a couple different ways. In Revelation 2, they wouldn't have had to test people to see if they were true or false apostles if, if they were only, uh, they were only the 12, you know. Uh, but then in, in chapter 21, it does speak of the 12. But Paul uses himself, uses it to, for himself, he uses it for Andronicus and Junia in Romans 16, 7. He uses it for um, Silas and Timothy. He uses it for James, the brother of Jesus, in Galatians 1, 19. And also in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 7, he says that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the twelve and then to some others, and then to all the apostles. So obviously Paul is using it for a larger group than the 12. Right. And the guy, the guy, he knew the proof texts for his positions, but he didn't know anything outside of the, well, I shouldn't say anything, but he didn't know how to answer, you know, somebody went outside the, the proof texts. And so he said, well, I don't think it's saying that. And so the, the young lady said, well, what do you think it's saying? And he said, well, I just don't think it, it means that. 
And she said, you lied to me. You told me you believed whatever the Bible said, but you only believe what your doctrine tells you that the Bible says. He says, are you willing to stake your salvation on that? She said, I stake my salvation in nothing except Jesus Christ. Uh, she's a she's a medical doctor now. I just heard from her a couple of days ago, so this is wow. fresh on my mind. I got to baptize her, uh, and she's she's fired up for Jesus. So, yeah, people people do weird things with the Bible. <laughs> they read into it their doctrines. Well, one of the things that I want to deal with is um, still connected to the Book of Acts. Uh, I had a friend who was an apostolic leader in uh, Hong Kong who worked in China named Dennis Balcom. Oh, yeah. And Dennis was telling me during the Cultural Revolution and uh, the the favorite book of the underground church, uh, because they, they didn't have Bibles. They, a lot of them were destroyed and he had to, you know, they'd write them by hand. was the book of Acts. Because oh, nice. it, it, it just told them what the early church was like and how they did things. And, and they were being persecuted, you know, and all. Mm -hmm. uh, but be that as it may, um, in Acts 8, the church is scattered in, in uh, around verse 1. It talks about Stephen's been killed. And, and the church is scattered, and they are all driven out of Jerusalem, except the apostles. The apostles stay in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And that's where right following that is where Philip then goes and has his revival mm -hmm. in, in Samaria in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, you've got Paul, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and Ananias and Paul, his experience. Mm -hmm. In chapter 10, you've got Peter at Cornelius' house and what happens there with the power of God and all the supernatural things that led to that, which around the world today, there's a lot of people coming to the Lord because of divine appointments and mm -hmm. visions and dreams and supernatural mm -hmm. healings and miracles, just as it was in the, in the, in the New Testament time, uh, particularly in Iraq, uh, and Iran. And, Iran. Mm -hmm. and, um, I remember one time I met with a, all, a, a lot of missionaries from the Middle East, Bill Johnson. And I went and did a conference for them. Um, but what I started to say is, there's this jump between Acts 8, 1, 2, 3 in there. And then I think it's uh, Acts 11. Yes. I think it's 17. And you really, you, you have this. 19. 19. So you have this interlude where you talk about Paul and Peter and Cornelius. And then we come back to the, 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 the church that had been scattered mm -hmm. and they went and they were preaching, uh, wherever they went. And I, I, I wanted to read this for those that may be watching because uh, and this is maybe it is going to come as a shock because I believe that when we talk about apostolic ministry, it's never meant, shouldn't be meant that uh, we believe that they, we, they are of a kind of a, a super Christian mm -hmm. uh, that. You know, they're the ones that has the ministry. They're the ones that does the miracles. They're the ones that can do the strategic level spiritual warfare and only them and not others. And you know, I, I really, really disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And because I don't think it's biblical. And I don't, uh, because he, he, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he, he gave gifts. Doma is a different word than charismata in, 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 in um, 1 Corinthians 12. And, and these are these uh, people who have functions and they're apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers, mm -hmm. or pastors and teachers. And um, for the equipping of the saints. Now, it can be translated through two different ways. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So they equip the saints who are helping do the work of ministry and for the full, you know, maturing to the fullness of nature, the statue of Christ. And, uh, and, and until Jesus comes, that's pretty much the summary or a paraphrase of the last part. Now, one of the purposes then of causing people to become mature in the Lord and to be equipped to do the works of ministry, it takes every one of those offices 
every one of those mm-hmm. functions, every one of those mm-hmm. titles, whatever we're going to call them, Doma gifts is what it, mm-hmm. it takes them all. Mm-hmm. And when one's missing and their part's not being played, I think it hinders mm-hmm. the, the eff- effectiveness mm-hmm. of the, of leadership training and raising up. So when we look at back to this passage in Acts, I think it's 11, as you mentioned, 19, mm-hmm. says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Of course, they were all Jews in this group. Mm-hmm. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, this is a term, it's a metaphor. But it's this metaphor, we, we need to unpack it because a lot of people are not going to. Oh. For the, the, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now this, this verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who was with them turned to the Lord. Now, the hand of the Lord is a metaphor in the Old Testament. It can be the arm of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. My hand is not so short that it cannot reach down and save. It was also a sign and a metaphor for the power Mm. of God. And so I believe that this term, the hand of the Lord was with them, was a Jewish euphemism of saying the presence and power of God Mm. was with not just the apostles who stayed in Jerusalem, but with these, and, and not just the evangelists like Philip mm. and Stephen, but are is with these people who've been persecuted and driven out lay people. So you have a, a ministry of the clergy and the laity. Mm. And one of the dangers I think that we might face, it was, I think people may not have thought through this, when we overemphasize the apostolic, mm. And they're the ones who has authority and power to do certain things that the rest of the church uh, don't when it comes to just regular ministry, healing and casting out demons and stuff like that. Then we're, we're rebuilding what the reformers tried to tear down. Yeah. This wall between clergy and laity. Mm-hmm. And, and so we end up with this, the disempowered laity again, if we're mm-hmm. not careful yes. the, without emphasizing, Hey, we are not superhero Christians, those who are in the apostolic. We're servants. Mm-hmm. And our servant is to serve the church. Yes. And our serving the church is serving the people, mm-hmm. building them up. So there are certain things that people in this role have, not that they're the only ones that have it, because you've already alluded in Acts 9. Mm-hmm. Ananias was not an apostle, but he's mm-hmm. the, it's really interesting. The most the, the most noted person in the New Testament other than Jesus is Paul. Mm-hmm. And everybody else that seems to be, have uh, received uh, the, the laying on of hands and an impartation and receiving of the Holy Spirit, it happened to the hands of apostles, except Paul. And it happened, in his case, through a layperson, mm-hmm. a disciple. Mm-hmm. At, so... And, and I think I think in the case of Timothy, the elders also laid hands on him when he received his gift, as well as Paul. But yeah, well, and that's true, and and that's First Timothy four fourteen, and there was accompanied by a prof- prophecy. prophetic el- mm-hmm. uh, prof- prophecy, well, the body of elders, and and but but by the way, elders, you could be an apostle, but you were still an elder. They they had. Um, like in the Jerusalem church, they had both apostles, apostles and, and elders. elders. And I think the, um, I think what that shows us is that the, the Jerusalem church, just like other churches needed to have elders, but the apostles, even though a lot of the apostles were located in Jerusalem, they had super local ministry, which isn't to say they're the only people that can have super local ministry because Philip obviously was, Philip actually paved the way, I think, for Peter, uh, uh, Philip is the first one to actually reach a Gentile because the, the, eunuch. the African court official, yeah, he's a eunuch, so he can't be a full proselyte, according to the most likely interpretation of that. And then um, he also, Philip also is preaching along the coast of Judea, and then he also goes to Caesarea. So when Peter 
is preaching along the coast and then ends up in Caesarea ministering to Cornelius, who's probably the first Gentile convert that the Jerusalem church knows about. Philip has actually been his forerunner in all that. So again, God uses a, I mean, it's, it's God who gets the glory. And the hand of the Lord, that phrase is also used in Acts 13, where, uh, I believe it's used in Acts 13, where, uh, Saul, who's also called Paul, confronts Elamus Bar-Jesus and says, uh, the hand of the Lord will be on you and you'll be blind for a season. And then, of course, you have the finger of the Lord back in Luke's first volume, in Luke 11, 20, is it 11, 19, or 20? Um, in, in Matthew 12, 28, the, um, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I think Matthew is giving an interpretation of what, uh, um, you know, explaining, you know, using explanatory language, but in Luke, if, if I, by the finger of God, cast out these demons, and um, I think that might be an illusion. It's used a, a few times in the Old Testament, like with the God writing the, the Torah, but I think maybe especially when the Pharaoh's magicians recognize with the plagues, you know, this was beyond anything they could do. This is the finger of God. So, I mean, yeah. So when we look at that, it, it, without understanding that background, you say, well, the hand of the Lord is with them. You you can miss that they too were experiencing the power, the miracles. I, I believe uh, the healings was present because this is one of the most common ways that you see deliverances. Uh, the illustration you just gave was uh, mm -hmm. about deliverances. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, particularly in, in Matthew and Luke. Mm -hmm. So as we're thinking about fivefold ministry, and it's going to be important for there to be humility and mm -hmm. focused on equipping the saints. Mm -hmm. And I do believe the better tr interpretation of how that, the, the Greek mm -hmm. can be read there is what a turn of uh, commentators I've read, because mm -hmm. I'm not good at Greek at all, is uh, the better reading is that the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Yeah, that's that's what I think also. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and the King James used to be a, the, what I called the, the, the comma, said, for the, um, for the equipping the saints, comma, for the work of ministry, comma, and then the next part, you know. So it was like this, they're to do all these things. It's a different way of reading it. Yeah, I don't think that would I don't think that would even work theologically in terms of the body of Christ, which is part of the context, and the equipping of gifts with grace, which is part of the context there and also in Romans twelve and First Corinthians twelve about the gifts. But what you were saying earlier about First Corinthians twelve, um, you know, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then, you know, he doesn't actually enumerate the others, but miracle workers and healings are actually separate from the apostles. Yes. So if apostles can have signs and wonders, it doesn't mean they're the only ones. Right. Because uh, now, healings don't have to be signs per se in the way that, like when we're breaking new ground for the kingdom, those are signs that get people's attention. Like it may not be as dramatic. I mean, you can be healed gradually or, or uh, God can answer the prayer through medicine or whatever, it's still an answer to the prayer. Uh, the same with the uh, elders uh, praying the prayer of faith in James James 5. It doesn't have to be dramatic, like a leg growing back. But, it, it, you know, if you're in an in evangelism context and a leg grows back, that's definitely a sign. I mean, that's, that's and, and God has other ways of getting people's attention. It doesn't have to be that dramatic, but uh, God... Yeah, I mean, we, I think we see a range of different ways that, that God works, but um, certainly on the, in, in evangelism, when I noticed that pattern in the book of Acts, that, yeah, there were other ways God could get people's attention sometimes, but the most common way was through signs and wonders. I said, you know, I've been witnessing to people for a long time, and people will often pray with me to accept Christ. And then I did my best as a young Christian trying to disciple them. I wasn't all that good at it, but I did my best uh, as a young Christian. But then 
seeing that, I said, okay, I'm going to start praying for people. And I was working, it was, it was summer break from college. I was working at a, um, an apartment complex and it was mainly, I want to say elderly people, but I think now I'm probably close to their age range. <laughs> uh, senior citizens, anyway, they were, um, mostly retired people. And so the one lady came by and she was, uh, she was sick with something. I asked her if I could pray with her. I prayed for her and nothing happened. So I thought, well, I, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying. Um, and, and also there was a book, it was actually published by University Press, How to Give Away Your Faith by Paul Little. And it suggested, mm -hmm. you know, pray for people. Most of them won't mind, they'll, they'll appreciate the, at least the thought, you know, and, and if God does something, it'll get their attention for sure. So I, uh, you know, the, one of the other neighbors there while I was working, she came by and she was complaining about her knee. She said the doctor couldn't do anything for her knee. So I asked her if I could pray for it. She said, well, sure, no harm in that. I prayed. A couple of days later, she comes back to me. She says, Craig, you're great. Like I had anything to do with it. Craig, you're great. My, my knee has been better ever since you prayed for it. Now I need to get you to work on my lungs. I've been <laughs> coughing up blood ever since... Uh, for, for a long time, and my, my doctor thinks I have lung cancer. So I said, okay, um, I'll come by on my lunch break and, and pray for you. And when I came by on my lunch break, um, I knew she was a chain smoker. So I said, you know, you, you probably should really give up smoking. She said, you know, my doctor tells me that too. <laughs> but I said, um, I'm going to pray for you. But whether God heals you or not, you need to be ready to meet him. So she prayed with me to accept Christ. And then I, I prayed for her and she quit coughing up blood and doctor said, wow, you don't have lung cancer after all. And God is gracious. But that was, I mean, I was just a, a Bible college student who was, who was working maintenance at an apartment complex. But God can use those things to get people's attention for the gospel. Yeah. We see it all the time. Yeah. I mean, on the, you see it on a massive level. But I mean, when I say we, I, mean, I literally mean the, the not people, just me, but the the, people you bring with you who are yeah, ordinary yeah. people. And, like, and ordinary people. We're all that, that people, says, but yeah. You know, I had an email um, just yesterday or today. And it's long about all this, this guy. He's just, he said, I'm just a blue collar worker, but he got touched a few. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago in one of our meetings and he's had all these healings and miracles. He's got a ream of them just, and he was just saying just amazing things that had happened just in the last few days. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thank